Greetings, everybody. You are going to experience a Nooner with Dave Lamont, and you better believe this one's starting right at noon, and there's a reason for that, and I'll explain that in a moment. I do have a wonderful guest standing by, a very dear friend will be with us in a couple of minutes, but let me get to uh, a topic I was has zero plans to talk about, and I'm in the car not 25 minutes ago, and something hit me. Um, I've been listening. I have Sirius XM, so I, I obviously listen to my friends in the Paul Castronovo show, but they're not on right now. So I was bumping around the last couple of days on their Turbo channel, which is one of their more energetic, punchy, hard rock kind of channels. I love Rage Against the Machine. It kind of fits me. And I uh, noticed the last couple of days they've been playing a lot of rage it's just one of those things i just get in a car and there it is it was this morning at 6 45 i'm rocking to killing in the name of uh i get in the car today at 11 35 and they're playing bulls on parade these are all great songs and then i got this thought and i don't know if you guys have had this thought too we have lost a lot of great rock and, and classic rock artists and over the last three or four years, some you know, whose health slowly declined, like the great Greg Allman, others that were major shocks like Tom Petty, Prince. We just did not see them coming. So I have to decline a phone call right now. That's always exciting. So you're like, oh, geez, did somebody against die from Rage Against the Machine? You ever notice when somebody starts getting a lot of songs on the air, you're like, are they dead? Did something happen to them? Well, no, as far as I know, the guys in Rage are all alive and well. But it was a scary moment when you're thinking, oh, no, not again. Because we've had too many of these things happen. So that's a little paranoia on my part that when somebody is uh, getting too much airtime on your Casey Kasem Top 40, look it up, those of you under 50, uh, you say, oh, God, they're not dead, are they? So happily, all the guys in Rage are alive and well. And you know what sucked about among the 850 billion things that stink about this pandemic has been all of the bands that were going to tour. Rage had actually gotten back together with their original focus, Zach De La Rocha. And I was like, yes, this is what I've been waiting for. And now we're waiting even longer. And who knows, with some of these bands, they may break up again while waiting to play. Because as I discussed in a nooner a while back, I have never quite figured out how some people can and others cannot handle success. Uh, Want to bring in my buddy, uh, a friend I've known for years and years and years. We, I don't even have, you notice, no notepad today. I don't need any notes. Uh, that's just ridiculous. We Why do I need? Notes? We don't need no stinking notes, man. We don't need any badges. We don't need notes. We need Ed Berliner, the man in the arena, uh, available everywhere you can get, uh, you listen to things and uh, you'll, You'll get a chance to whore yourself out later. Um, well, of course, it's the media. We all get that chance sooner or later. I mean, we do it every damn day. Yes, that's why we're in the business. <laughs> so I've noticed on your shows lately, you have been talking a lot of NFL. And my analogy with the NFL is they remind me of the guy who's had too much to drink and is staggering between tables, but it can't, hasn't fallen down yet. Somehow it's still propped up despite the amount of booze it's consumed. It's luckily bouncing from table to table and hasn't fallen down yet. So, in other words, that would be Julie serving us the drinks. In, in, in inside joke, it's okay. Don't it? Don't, don't don't go there. Anymore. No, we're all we're completely dry <laughs> right now and hating every minute of it. But we're completely yeah, no dry. Uh, but you've been talking about this quite a lot, I know, on your shows. And yeah. where do you stand on the fact that? Look, I've done Tuesday and Wednesday football games that were scheduled in colleges. Uh, we had the bizarre 340 game uh, the other day because they didn't want to take off the tree lighting at Rockefeller Center. Um, how is the NFL looking to you this year? Uh, a joke, uh, really, and a bad joke, too, because in my opinion, and a lot of people that I've spoken to and a lot of people who cover the league, but I've thought this for a long time, it's an illegitimate season. Uh, it will always carry with it an asterisk, always. It has to, because in a normal season, you have players who are hurt on the field. Something happens and you have a quarterback who goes down, a, an offensive lineman who's out for a, a short period of time, a, a defensive back that's gone. And that happens because 99% of the time what happens on the field that he takes an injury. In this case, you're dealing with things that could have been controlled in a different sense. You're dealing with Mother Nature and the pandemic. So you're dealing now with entire teams or entire quarterback cores, for instance, in Denver, that are wiped out by nothing that happened on the field, simply what happened because 
the players, the coaches, and the organization were too big of a knucklehead to really just pay attention and follow simple rules, which others could, but they can't seem to do it. So you've then changed the competitive balance of the teams, not from what happens on the field. It would be as if it would be as if somebody came in and said, okay, all of a sudden we have 10 players on the team that are illegal and we have to deport them immediately. <laughs> I'm surprised that hasn't happened yet. But Which could happen thing. any day now. Exactly. But if you had like if you had the INS walk in and say, Oh, sorry, 10 of you over here, you're out. Well, that changes the makeup of the team, that changes the makeup of the offense, the defense, what they can do. It then could take a very good team and turn it into a really bad team. And that's what we've had here. We have great teams that are out there. No doubt the Steelers are one of the better teams in the NFL. You can't knock it. You can't argue with it. You have these teams that are able to hold it together. But when you change the competitive balance outside of what happens on the field, you are then creating a season that without question has to have an asterisk. And I, you know, I hate that word. So do I. Because it, in, in, a, in a sense, for those of us of a certain age, we remember or can go back to the Roger Maris years where Maris carried for all those years an asterisk on defeating Babe Ruth's single season home run record because they played more games than Ruth played. It doesn't make a difference. A season is a season. And the asterisk finally disappeared. But this season will now have to forevermore be talked about the 2020 season where the competitive nature was changed because the competitive balance was changed in the middle of the season several times. And, of course, now you have the San Francisco 49ers who are being forced to play games in Arizona. Look, you're still playing a road game then. It changes the complex of the game. It changes the look of the game. It changes everything. So you're going to have a Super Bowl champion one way or another. I mean, maybe they'll have to play the game in uh, in Iceland by the time it's done. But to me... It, it's a season that always must be considered to be, and, and I, I don't want to, I, I use the word illegitimate, and that's really maybe too strong. It's not legit in the scope of what has been past NFL seasons. Let me fire the other side of this then, just for sure. the heck of it. Would it be more difficult to win a championship this year in these environments? Should that not be celebrated that a team was able to negotiate this snooker table of bumpers and, and somehow come out on top? No, no, because it's simple. It, it really is very simple. And what the players were told, the NFL took a chance. And I wasn't, I didn't like the chance. I still don't like the fact that college football played, uh, period. I, I don't think they should have for a number of reasons. But you have certain teams and franchises where the players get it, where they're not the usual knuckleheads who go out and play around at the clubs or have to go out and take three days off with their friends somewhere, or who don't follow simple rules. The NFL set the rules. Look, guys, you're professionals. This is, we're asking you to do this for one season. It's not as if we're asking you to change your life for the rest of time. Socially distance, stay in your homes, wear the masks, do everything you can, and we'll be able to get through this. You've had teams that haven't done that. Why? The players. And also, let's not forget the coaches. Sean Payton has to absolutely take a big hit for this because he's the guy who's in the locker room while the Saints players are all celebrating their win in Tampa Bay. He's in the middle of the Instagram videos. Mm. He's pushing it forward. He's just as guilty as the rest because he's the guy who needs to be saying, guys, stop. This is, this is going to get out. We're going to get punished, and I'm going to lose players or we're going to lose draft picks. Even he couldn't keep control. But you have teams like the Steelers – Keep going back to them. They've managed to keep it together, and their players have followed the rules. And that's and that's really simple to do, and anybody could have done it. But when people like Cam Newton, the Denver Broncos, the New Orleans Saints, the Miami Dolphins, and others who do it and take the gamble, you you know you you pay the gamble, you you pay for it. You take the gamble, you pay the risk eventually. Right, but I think you're you're punishing the good in addition to the bad. No. Tough. Sorry. Uh, you, you can't split it because it's it's a league. It's teams in a league. And I'm not saying that teams didn't do well, but those teams that are following the rules are thus playing uh, depleted teams. 
They're playing teams that don't have their quarterback, that don't have their running back, that don't have the offensive lineman who's the key to protecting the quarterback, that don't have the great linebacker or the defensive back. So you're giving them an unfair advantage because the players on the other side of the field weren't hurt because of what happened on the field. Right. They simply didn't follow the rules. So in essence, you're giving a team, let's, if you want to numerically paint it, you're giving a 10, a chance it would normally maybe play in a regular season would play a seven, let's say, because the, the schedules work out that sure, way. Sure, of course. You have a 10 playing a two now because they are a depleted team. That's not really very competitive. It, it doesn't follow the competitive nature of the game itself. And you're then rewarding the good team for playing a team that, frankly, doesn't have enough players to get the job done. What are we? Division three college football? No, are, but wait a minute. Are we the University of Miami playing FAMU? But at the same time, if there's I, I keep going back to if you've done nothing wrong, why should you eat it? You know, that well, that's 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 the only thing that concerns me is that if the Steelers if we keep using them as an example, if they haven't done anything wrong other than suck in the red zone, as Mike Tomlin beautifully said the other day. <laughs> In case no one heard that, they asked him, what was the problem with the red zone? He goes, we sucked, which might have been the best soundbite of the year. I like that. Remember when sucked was a word you couldn't use on the air? <laughs> yes. I remember the first guy. I know we're slightly getting off topic, but what did yeah, you expect? Um, I remember the first guy I ever heard use the word, and that was Ron Harrison, our old buddy from WINZ Radio, going back to that controversial Miami-Notre Dame game with a fumble that really wasn't a fumble and it helped Notre Dame yeah. win. And he goes, to use the vernacular, and why do I remember this? To use the vernacular, it <laughs> sucked. And I remember going, geez, Ron, wow. That's, this is 1988. Remember about Ron Harrison. Smoke, Harrison. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's another anyway, one. That's well, a round well, table, though. because That was on talk. Table. But, but right, go, go that's, that's, the only, that's the only beef. Well, I said, that, that's, a, uh, that's the only part of your argument I can't completely embrace is that I still I keep it. looking at those who are doing it right. In other words, you're handing out speeding tickets to everybody on I-95 when only 50% of them are actually speeding. Um, oh, on the other hand, they're punishing themselves by screwing up and not doing what you suggested, to, you know, you, not following the rules. Well, but unfortunately, the, the 95 analogy doesn't work because we're not dealing in a competitive league here where you only have X number of teams and X number of players, and you're dealing with a, a sport, if you will. And I, and I get what you're saying, and, it's, and it's, I'm not comfortable with it. I wish we could say that they do get a break, but you don't. You're part of a league. The league plays with teams, with franchises, with rules. Everybody abides by the rules. Now, the Steelers have done it, and other teams have done it, too. We just bring them in here. Right. But unfortunately, the competitive balance is changed by what others did. So the nature of the competitive balance has to be noted then in future years. Because, look, the, the team that wins a Super Bowl last year, the year before, the year before, the year before, and the teams that will win Super Bowls ahead of us are going to do it in a competitive league where players are there, where everybody competes, where there's nothing at the last minute where a team is flying and all of a sudden two guys are on the plane and somebody comes up and says, you both tested positive, you're not playing. It's not going to happen anymore. Right. So you're then dealing in a truly competitive league, and that's what sports is all about. So the Steelers, if they did, or whatever team is, will win the Super Bowl, and they will be the winner of the Super Bowl. But the season and how they got there has to be marked as an anomaly. As, oh, yeah. as no. a season that did not reach the competitive level of seasons before and seasons to come. No, I think you know, anomaly is the absolute perfect word. It is the ultimate outlier of a season. And you mentioned college football, and that's kind of where I wanted to worm my way into next because I attended the Florida-Kentucky game Saturday, and, and I had heard, first off, that game wasn't even going to be played. On Tuesday, I got a text saying, no game. So cancel your plans to come to the game. Like, oh, bummer, you know, but that happens. And then as the days went on, I never got any confirmation on it. And so all of a sudden, here I am on Saturday with my wife and another person watching the game and watching a depleted Kentucky team completely collapse. Now, Florida's better than they are, and I'm sure they were going to win anyway. But on a very reasonable day in Gainesville, weather-wise, not an uncomfortable day, not a day where your, your shirt is soaked and you're drinking five gallons of water. There were kids cramping for Kentucky because they were probably playing more minutes than they ever have before. And 
extra plays than they ever had before. And yeah, Kentucky was at a competitive disadvantage. Florida there's, there's had the their problems. Right there. There's the phrase. Right. And, the, then, and there was proof of that. Yeah, you, when you've put them, and that's what college football has done. They have put these teams at a competitive disadvantage. Now, if you're going to play the sport for the sport itself, you want to be as uh, competitive as you possibly can. But you can't do that. And, you, and And again, that's why college football this year is the greater sham than the NFL. And whoever wins the national championship this year in college football, if we ever do get there, that is truly an illegitimate national championship because conferences did not play. Full teams did not play in conferences. Schedules were changed completely to punch in teams that weren't at the competitive level of these other teams. So you're playing, you're basically playing, look, this is a Sega season more than anything else or an Xbox season. You're going against a guy who's been playing Xbox for the last 20 years and all of a sudden there's somebody who walks in for 10 minutes and doesn't even know how to run the controller. It's it's a competitive disadvantage is what you're doing here in, 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 this, in this makeup. And yeah. I, I honestly haven't watched a lot of college football this year. I don't want to I because I, I know what I'm getting for it. I'm getting – I'm not getting the best game possible. And there's this, this doesn't even bring in the fact that, again, these young men are not professionals. They don't get paid. And you are asking them to put their lives on the line for greed, for money, for conference money, for sponsorship the TV money, TV money in particular, TV money, the whole thing. That's yeah. the only reason why yeah. any college football, don't let anybody kid anybody else. It's the only reason why college football is playing in the NFL too. And the rest of them is the money. They, they, they can't let that money go. They've got to find a way to grab some of it somehow. And that's why you had the NFL or the NHL play in a bubble. The NBA play in a bubble. Can't let the money go. But in college athletics specifically, and with the conference money, the, the, literal billions of dollars that are thrown around. And, and here's another thing that our buddy Joe Casal and I have talked about many times. The, the honorariums in colleges, the, the money that colleges have set aside, they've got hundreds and millions of dollars set aside. They don't need that. They could, could, could colleges go a season without playing college athletics, big time college athletics and make money. You're damn right. They could. They, and tuitions wouldn't have to go up. Kids wouldn't have to be losing their educations because there is plenty of money at these colleges that is sitting there in reserve, but all they're doing is they're using it because they want to make more. And I think it's unfortunate because they have forced college athletes to basically become the bearers of putting it out there and, and creating the possibility that someone could catch a disease, a, a virus and die. And, and unfortunately, you, you, and that hasn't happened yet. A couple right. of times. And, and, and fortunately, that hasn't happened yet. The other thing, though, I would say that they're not making very much money right now because of the, the massive budget cuts that are going on and the massive layoffs. Now, you have the weird things that are going on where smaller sports are getting cut, and yet there's talk of big-time coach buyouts that may or may not be coming this year. Or in some cases, some coaches will probably keep their jobs because they don't want to pay the buyout or can't afford in the athletic departments themselves uh, to, to pay that buyout, which is going to be another interesting offseason this year because there are always guys who lose their jobs for not performing well. But this year in particular, there are some big names that are threatened. Jim Harbaugh being one of them. I don't think Michigan will fire him. I think he will leave before they ever fire him. Tom Herman at Texas the perhaps the the most perpetually overrated program out there <laughs> yeah, it, it right. is uh, yeah it is no, I, mean, right. I know i know you mentioned miami a while back and i almost wrote something on your youtube comment about wait a minute let's not forget about texas and usc is another one the, the glamour teams that we all want to have as part of the national picture uh but have stumbled in, in Miami, certainly included in that, have stumbled all over the place. Anyway, and let's, I, you bring up Miami. Miami rises in the national rankings without playing three weeks. Right, because I mean, they didn't do anything wrong. That's the only <laughs> thing, reason. That's the only reason. I know. What it makes a fallacy sense. that is. I what, understand. What a fall it is that a fallacy. Is. And they're stuck now out on the outside looking in, unless there's a massive upset with Virginia Tech and Clemson, of which there will not be, uh, because it was decided. Uh, without them having a chance to play Notre Dame, Notre Dame would take the number two seed. And they maybe they right. were forced into doing that. And that's how – I don't know if it was money or just – With convenient. Notre Dame, come on. Come on. With Notre well, Dame, it's, you'll get you'll get, you'll get get 150 times the audience on national television for Notre Dame than you will for anything with Miami. 
Uh, probably if they make the playoff and, and, you know, I don't know how that's all going to go. And, and they didn't, they, they thought they might expand it to eight to make it more fair, but that's not going to happen. And I'm not surprised that's not going to happen. That's a pretty ironclad deal they have for a few more years. It's, I think the thing that's upsetting is, is we were over a hundred games canceled. It's terribly unfair to the fans. It's terribly unfair to the coaches who prepare. I, the weirdness of what's happening is that who is it now? We're getting a BYU Coastal Carolina matchup instead of Liberty University. Now, in a way, in a way, I'm I'm interested in this because these are two teams that would never meet under any circumstances, and we're seeing. Well, you fill in here. Well, you, here, I'll, it's like being on a playground and they're picking kids. I'll oh, take yeah. Berliner. Uh, okay, uh, I'll take Lamont, and you know we start playing against each other, and that's the weird stuff to me that's going Who's on. Left over? Right? Oh, the big fat kid over there. Come on over. Right? Here. Yeah, yeah. Blutarski, get in here. <laughs> uh, you know, I. That's the stuff I never thought I'd see, and you're right. Uh, there's, we all know that money is a part of this. I feel badly for the kids who do want to play. Um, now we have the other scenario that's coming up, and I want to ask you about this too. We're getting players who are just walking away. And there's a debate, are these guys smart or are they gutless or 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 quitters because they're quitting on their team? Uh, I, I go with if you have a pro chance and your team is like Florida State, for example, completely out of it, you're not going to a bowl game in my backyard, then protect your body. And if you really think you have an NFL aspirations, I've learned to live with that. Let's get rid of the gutless and coward right away let's throw that out because that's insulting because it, it has nothing well, to do with that, uh, that's has, what i've read i'm it just telling you that's not my opinion that. but the people who say that are despicable in many ways because these are people who many times likely have never played a competitive sport and don't know what it takes to be able to sacrifice your body your mind your time to be able to get involved in a sport anybody who calls these players names such as that here i'll give you some numbers 14,174,983. It's the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 in America right now as you and I are speaking. Today, 31,182 cases. Yesterday, it was 218,000 cases. As you and I speak right now, 407 more people have been confirmed dead in America due to COVID-19 complications. Yesterday, it was 2,531 the highest number we've had. I don't blame these kids at all. I don't blame the athletes, the coaches who don't want to be there. This is a killer virus that is killing people. It is killing people of all ages. And specifically, it has an inordinate, uh, an inordinate amount of effect on, on African Americans. Hispanics are being crushed more by COVID-19. So, to say I'm going to walk away, to, and, and I, here's my point on this. You've got a player who's stunningly brilliant, who's greatly talented, and has a marvelous chance to play in the National Football League. One chance. It's all they get. And these chances rarely ever come by again. Maybe a, a rare player will get a second chance. But the player has decided that I can't take a chance on infecting my mother, my father, my sister, my brother, my family, my aunts, my uncles, my grandmother, whatever. I can't take a chance on this. And I would rather live than play a sport. If I get a chance again, I'm sure as hell going to give it a chance and hopefully somebody will. I have great respect for that. I mean, I find that to be an admirable thinking. And somebody needs to give these players a second chance. Somebody needs to give them another chance on a scholarship. Give them another year. Extend it if they have one. Well, Find a way. It was done last right. year with the, with the, when they when they yanked all the spring sports away, um, yeah. and that caused a, a bit of a complication in some ways. It caused a ripple effect. If you were a high school player coming in, what was going to happen to you? Uh, that was the only weird part about all of that. You know, it, all of a sudden a guy gets an extra year and he wasn't supposed to be there, and you've got player Z who's a wait, I got a scholarship. What do you do with me now? Um, that that was kind of the unfortunate downside of all of that. But it's not fair to punish them. It, it, it's I not agree. fair. No, it's not because they didn't. We, we have to find a way to continue to give, to allow the high school athlete to continue to go to college 
and and get to play. But again, this is this is a an, an academic exercise that we continue to go over, and we've had this now for fifty plus sixty years, whatever we've talked about this. What is the main purpose of a higher education, of a higher learning institution? The education. I don't hear anybody talking about the fact that well, we've got to get this kid a chance to play in the NFL. You and I both know how rare that is. Mm -hmm. to play in the NFL or to play in the NBA or the NHL or what or more Major League Baseball coming out of college, even more so. Where's the education? We, I don't hear anybody saying, you know, we've got to give John Jones a chance to play in the NFL, but damn it, we're going to make sure that he gets his education, gets his degree, and make sure that he's got more to stand on than having to worry about a pro career where he might be out in six weeks if he breaks a leg and never gets to play again. Let's make sure that he's ready for life after sports. Well, okay. That to me is more important. I think the public doesn't say that, Ed. And right. that's the difference. I think people in athletics, the good ones, do say that. And they do try to follow through. Mm, I, don't know. I, I think they do. More than you think. Uh, I'm not saying everybody. God knows. And the problem is it's a hell of a lot sexier to talk about the guys who are going and the guys who, you know, and, and, or the one-and-done college basketball sure. players, for example, who are legally – allowed to do this, by the way, because to me, there's no difference between a one and done college basketball player and a one and done political science major who decides, you know what, I have a job waiting for me now. I'm I can get you. education later. And it's I'm legally been proven. That's why the NBA can't go marching into court to demand that college kids play for four years, because the first judge that gets that suit's going to laugh their ass right out of court. So I, I do think that there is an emphasis on education in some places. Yes, there are guys who are who are just there to have that chance to play ball. But you know, you mentioned how rare that is. Let's say out of seventy-five players, you might get three kids who have a chance to make a penny off of that. Those other seventy Maybe. need that education. Yes, and hopefully they take advantage of it. Again, not everybody does. There are screw ups on teams, just as there are screw ups in life uh, outside of college. Ideally, you can provide everything in a college, the complete college experience from those who only want an education and who never go to a football game or attend a baseball game in their life, to those who wrap themselves up in Greek life and become a member of a frat or a sorority, or for those who are athletes, for those who are every, ideally you have all of that. That's what a whole college is to me. That Why did I go to college? Because I wanted to get a degree and, and push my career. Um, that was my purpose for college. And but I, I, it should do all of those things. Ideally. It should, it should, but it doesn't. It, it, it still doesn't. There is still, and and this is just an opinion garnered from talking to people I know, covering the sport, being around it, but continuing to interview people to this day, that there is still major college, major athletic programs that specifically, when it comes to football and basketball, they don't give a damn if if the player gets an education. You better play and you better win games. That's still the main thinking because that's what they're there for. They're there to win games because the kid who's got a 3.9 GPA doesn't help if he doesn't score the winning touchdown in the big game against the, the, the conference rival. And it's still that's what makes the money is the performance on the field. And there's still coaches. Look, let, let's, let's be even more honest here. I don't think Nick Saban has ever given a dog damn about whether or not a lot of his players graduate. I really don't. And there's a lot of other coaches that I think I can say that about as well. They don't care. Well, if the kid gets a degree, excellent. But I tell you what, I'm making $6.5 million a year to coach this football team, and i got to win a championship, or I'm out on my ass, and I don't have the big, uh, I don't have the big show to play with. I, I still think that's a prevalent thinking with a lot of big-time college coaches and, and administrators as well. I think the problem with that is I think you're right, but it's not a complete picture. They do worry about these things for a couple of reasons, and they are somewhat cynical. They, you know, if a kid can't hack it in school completely and he loses that recruit who could have been valuable, if that kid flunks out or is academically ineligible, then the coach is screwed. So he does have to have right. some interest in making sure that kid at least shows up in class and posts yeah. some sort of a grade that is passing. Um, do they care if they walk across the stage to get that sheepskin? I think a lot of them don't. And I think you're right. The pressures they accept along with the big checks they're accepting include win. And no, <laughs> I have yet to hear to your, to add to your point, a, um, a coach's press conference, bringing in the new guy 
and they don't ever talk about, hey, uh, boy, his grade point average was awesome. At uh, He graduated 78% of his players last year. You know, that might matter at places like Stanford or Northwestern, but guess what? Those kids are graduating. That's a special yeah. bunch of, of, of people who go there. But and a couple and other schools as well. We laugh at Vanderbilt because athletically they're terrible for the most part, but it's a school for very intelligent people. And, you know, you don't have to worry about those guys' grade point averages. They put the effort into because they're, they're there to get both. But you're right. There are uh, the, the kids who were just there. Hey, I just want to get paid. I just want to get through and get and get out of here and go ahead and try to get my money. And I'm going to sign with an agent one tenth of a second as soon as the season's over. I just want to see the colleges themselves. And again, I'm, I'm being idealistic here because this will never happen. We're, we're way past this. It would be nice if all of the colleges and the major colleges, the ones that have the major athletic programs in, in basketball and in football, who were always concerned about the education and the athletic growth of the player. I, I would love to see that, but it's not going to happen. We're, we're past that. We lost that in the 70s and the 80s where the money really started to kick up and where championships became big and coaches started to make big money, which is why, again, I, I kind of come back to the player. If a player says, I can't play the, the, the sport because of the contact that's involved, but I still want to get my education and I still want to graduate, I think that the colleges need to make a, a, need to make a change and say, look, we, we signed them, we got them under a scholarship here to play sports for us, but it's completely out of our hands. Why he doesn't want to play sports. It's mother nature. It's a virus. It's a pandemic. We can't control that. We have to honor that scholarship. Well, I, think I, I think they are. I think they are. Yeah. I don't know that to be true. I hope they are. I think they are. If you want to continue now, if you just drop out of school, that's another matter altogether. And that will happen yeah. because if you really are serious about the pros for the NFL, then you've got to start training for the combine, which they have not changed the schedule on that yet. And they right. may not. So you've got to start that. I'll understand. You've got to go to these, you know, you know, the rest of that stuff. They have all these places that train these kids. Um, but I think and it, it also another movement that has come that made me feel good is that I think the University of Maryland was one of the first to say, you get a scholarship. It is your scholarship. If you get, you know, if you quit your sport, you're still there. You, that is yours for life instead of, and a lot of people did not know this in the public. It was a year to year deal. Yes. Coach could call you in and go, you know, uh, Bob, I, I'm i sorry. I'm bringing in three uh, guards and a, and a power forward this year, and you're kind of not needed around here anymore. So, you know, I got a Division two on the line. They'll take you. Have a nice day. Yeah. And without the kids saying, hey, Coach, I think I'd rather go to a different school, that happens a, a lot. Boy, does that happen a lot in college basketball now. Uh, but it's – I, I don't think it's quite as awful as it used to be with honoring scholarships and, and besides situations that are good PR, like let's say you have somebody who ends up with a medical condition that they can't play, but they'll honor the scholarship. You know, that happens. Um, well, but I see that's the other thing too, that. because we still have, and you and, I, you and I both know that we have college athletes who suffer career ending injuries while they're playing college athletics and they are not set for life by any means, not even medically. That, that, that medical is not paid for the rest of their lives. To not for the rest of their lives, no. No. no, but if but if somebody if somebody suffers a, a, a career ending leg injury that is going to change the way they walk and, and is basically going to uh, make them physically different than what they were, they don't get a there's no pension plan here. There's no medical no, plan no, here no, that covers no, no. them. They're gonna get covered until the until basically the uh, the attending physician and therapist says, can't do anything more for you, and then they cut you loose. I mean, that's a lot of times what people don't realize is these are college athletes, and many times there's a lot of broken bodies that walk out there and a lot of broken minds, too, from a lot of the, the physical and the mental uh, demands of it that I'm sorry, but I've seen far too many colleges just figuratively spit on those players because they can't win games for us anymore. We've done as much as we can. Have a nice day. Yeah, And, and that's that's upsetting. But let's also remember this is – we've no one's ever been here before. This is all new ground. This whole pandemic and how we're and how we're dealing with it and what we're deciding, and that's why I think there needs to be a, a little bit of a pullback sometimes. Let's think about this before we do it. Boy, thinking but, is out of fashion these days. 
Thinking's out of fashion all across the board. I'd like to see that more in, in, in professional and college athletics, which is is sort of the reason why, not to, to kind of make a, a switch here, why the NHL is not getting started on their January 1st date because they're going back and forth and back and forth and going, wait a minute, we got to stop here because we've got to have games, we've got to have fans, or else we're going to have franchises go under. And we've got to have the players recognize. And I give, hey, tell, I tell you what, I give Gary Bettman a lot of credit for this. He came out publicly and told the players, "Look, I'm not learning. I'm not trying to redo the collective bargaining agreement here, but because of what happened last year, which was completely out of our hands, you, the players, are going to have to realize you're going to have to take a pay cut. Everybody's going to have to make less money because if you don't, franchises are going to fold, and then there's going to be people out of work." I applaud him for that. I wish. Um, I wish more sports would I'm do that. shocked that franchises are in that kind of position. Well, but in the NHL, they will be because the NHL is just that one out of the big four sports that truly relies on their fan base more than anything else because they don't have the fat TV contract. That's true. If you look at it through all the, the, the four power sports, if you will, and in, in, include NASCAR, if you want, and golf, if you want to make it six, and even tennis. Well, no, you can't. Tennis is a very different, uh, different animal. I think golf is, too. I think so much of that is, yes, but they have the PGA, nice but, but the PGA yeah, has the PGA. a television contract, which is fat. And so does the USGA, but not as fat as the PGA. But right. Yeah. Anyway. Right. So out of those that you have, let's put in the six in there. Hockey has the worst. Because yeah, they, do. they don't even have a um, look. They, they bounce between outlets right now between NBC, uh, MSNBC, CNBC, MS, uh, NBC Sports, and I think ESPN wants to get back in it now because it's hot again. But that deal may not even go off. No, because I, the, the ratings again. Because well, ESPN, ratings ESPN, ESPN is running. too busy cutting people across the board, so it's right. another story altogether. Yeah, no, it's, right it's, about that. It's, it's all different. This is all real virgin territory we're dealing in here. And that's why it's it's become um, it's become interesting to watch how the leagues and the players are dealing with it and how it changes from sport to sport to sport. Well, we're going to have a dramatically different NBA because the bubble was a massive success, although it took a toll on people mentally. But it, they had zero positive tests. Only two or three guys who wandered off on their own, and they were swiftly punished for it, and also endured public humiliation. But now we already know with the December 20, 18 days from the start of the season, and the damn season just ended about an hour ago. Not into it at all. And I'm, I'm, I, I can't get excited about it. It's 18. It's well, just, I, I'm having a hard time, too. I needed, a, I needed more time off. I, I enjoyed what I watched. I will tell you that I enjoyed you know the We were all dying for sports to come back again, and sports finally came back, and here we are. And I agree with you. It's too soon. Just, we're going, we need a little time off. We need a break. On the other hand, to be fair to the teams that did not participate in the bubble, I, I get it. And I get the whole TV thing. I get all of that. But here we are 18 days away. They had, I believe the number was 46 players test positive out of about 540. Yep. I'm, I'm very close on those numbers. So that's something we never had to deal with. And so now the league, and I would give the NBA credit, they're pretty forward about the way they do things in the public, and the commissioner's pretty, pretty swift, swift, pretty swift, swift guy. Swift, he's swifty too. Swift too. Um, but they're going to be dealing with stuff they didn't deal with in the bubble, and I'm dying to see what's going to happen to these schedules because we've already seen. I'll use my own son as an example at Texas Tech, where my son is a graduate assistant. They had St. John's bail on a game because St. John's had some COVID issues, and they were fortunate enough to rebook a new opponent for tonight so they can still put 4,000 fans in their arena if they get that many and uh, and make up for it and keep their competitive, the competitive balance. There you go. Um, in a non-conference game, no. No. And I is St. John's better than Troy? Yes. Yes. Um, but I would be more concerned with conference than non-conference at this point. And, okay. and, and because and you have more games in college basketball than you do with the NFL. I your yeah. NFL point, I, and I'll be honest, your NFL point was really good um, about the competitive balance. I had a weird angle from two things: gambling and fantasy, because even that's been messed up a little bit. And I, I'm dabbling, and this is absolutely the end for fantasy. I'm going to save that for another show this year. I'm done with it, but it has nothing to do with the pandemic. But if you're trying to just play in that, let's say you are somebody who's competitive and really, really into it, I can't even imagine how you're enjoying this season. And if you're a gambler, I guess you're enjoying it in a weird way. Like you could have put $8 billion on the Saints 
you know, and won because you knew they were going to beat Denver last week with the mess that Denver had. The poor guy playing quarterback who last played quarterback when he was six years old on the elementary school playground. <laughs> you know, he was all time quarterback. Um, so that 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 has affected it as well. It's just been you touched on it. It's it's unprecedented. The, we seem to be in the mind that this is probably going to be a one off. That we're not going to be dealing with this crap next year. Mm-hmm. By yeah, the fall. You, by the you, fall. I'm baseball, look. Look, baseball is going to be dealing with this because if you look and there's an interesting. Um, the New York Times had a very interesting chart the other day, where. It was asking, and it was based, uh, there was a CDC, the NIH, and there were others who were involved in it, where it asked you to give your county, uh, state, your age, and asked you a couple of very simple questions about what you do for a living. And then it placed you in line for where you will get your shot. Oh, I didn't see that. In deference to um, frontline workers Mm -hmm. um, and others. And I tried it. I think I'm going to get my shot somewhere around 2084. Oh, good. You know, I'm, I'm be around because I'm because I'm healthy, um, don't have a lot of underlying conditions, live in a certain area. But it it gauged it all. You're going to have a lot of people, and remember, two shots now. Mm-hmm. You know, people keep forgetting that they think they're going to get one shot. You know, Lady Shannon tells me all the time that there's people there who think they're going to get one shot. It's all going to be fine. No, you're going to get much time shot. in between the two. I think it's a month. Okay, think, is, it, is it two weeks or four weeks? I'm not sure, but I, it might be. It might be a month because one is a one is a, a beginner and then you have to have a booster mm-hmm. basically to get you going. I remember those. So, but the, see, we're, we're <laughs> everything old is new again. Um, you know, you're going to have people who are going to have to take these these shots, and it's going to it definitely will go past springtime and mm-hmm. go into the beginning of summer, and then let's open the Pandora's box. You are going to have people who will not touch the vaccine, no matter what. Oh, you will I know. Have the, the anti-vaxxers. Yeah. You will have the conspiratory uh, theorists who will say that it's a tracker put, put in my body by uh, by uh, Steve Jobs or or somebody, um, uh, Bill Gates. So you're going to have a portion of society that is not going to undergo the 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 actual uh, immunizations. So from a sports perspective, think about it. Baseball will probably begin if baseball tries to begin a 2021 season as normal with uh, spring training in February and March. With spring, right? You're still going to have a tremendous amount of the country that is not going to be vaccinated. You're still going to have a lot of cases. Then you're going to get into April, May, and June, and finally people are going to get it, get their vaccinations. But then you're going to look into June, July, and August for the people who don't. And what happens to those who are still with the virus? Who are coming down off it, if you will, and who are you know, we're still trying to create that immunity in the country. It's I still think that things are going to be changed drastically, even for 2021. The NFL, by the time it comes around, may be good to go. And college football as well. We probably football, will have some normalcy. Right? Yeah, college bad. That would be nice. A lot of tension in our house about that. All right, we've been way too damn serious. Um, so I did have a question for you regarding something that we are passionate about. There you go. Well, that's one of them. What was that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you said you're driving later. Uh, you know, the, we did a show a while back where we were required to have alcohol, and uh, today yes. uh, it's just it's a sobering afternoon with uh, with Ed and Dave. Um, that sucks, right. man. We got to do it again. I'm, I still swear that we you know, we should get four of us together in the, the 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 gang and just do a show twice a week and just cocktail it that's it we're, we're, we're drinking for the show imagine what that show will be like after about 45 minutes you know where to find me thank you okay. uh, you don't even have to uh-huh. hesitate you don't even have to hesitate <laughs> i'll host it you can host it i don't care anyway i was going to ask this because this is something that we do take and i use the biggest air quotes i've ever used seriously we have comedy movies that we are very passionate about but they are old movies They are the Animal Houses, the Caddyshacks, the Naked Guns, the Airplanes. These are movies that are very old. Is there anything in the last decade that has been close to comparable? And I do think the Ted movies were pretty damn funny. Very funny. Good call. And that might be it, though. Is there anything else that you've seen that that could measure that could actually link arms with the the blazing saddles and young Frankensteins no. of the world? No, 
I, yeah. I agree. I mean, there's there's funny movies out there. I mean, but again, most of it we're not even seeing movies these days. Mostly is what we see is binge series. Oh no, that's a different. I'm I'm talking about movies, not not, not TV shows. Yeah, I um, off the top of my head, I would say probably you're right on the TED movies, but I I can't think of anything that I've seen recently that would really make me laugh out out loud. What did I see the other day? It was a uh, oh the the funniest thing I've seen recently wasn't a movie. It was Jeff Dunham. The ventriloquist mm -hmm. who did a and who did a new show with brand new material. Oh, I've seen the promos, but I haven't seen the show. See it. It's it's okay. the funniest thing that Dunham has ever done. And it was it was laugh out loud from from start to finish. Okay, good. But comedy has be but look, comedy has changed so much from the movies you mentioned to now. I remember just a few weeks ago I read an article where it was a um a young girl who wrote the author, and I mean young, she was 17, wrote it and authored it, and she said the movie Airplane was not only not funny, but it was insulting. It was um, uh, anachronistic was the word she used. Um, she put in all the great phrases in there. And she said it just isn't a movie that anybody, I think she, she finished it by saying it's a movie that no one should see from this point going forward. It's a little that. late now, lady. Well, you know, but all the comedy that you just talked about is era based, E R A, era based. Oh, listen, uh, I what was it? We were bored one night and came across Sanford and Son. Never something that I enjoyed. Well, we did, I did. And Good. may I point out, because if you did this today, that the big laugh line included the N word. Oh, yeah. Now, in the 70s, you had Archie Bunker spoke it on All in the Family, Sanford and Son, absolutely. And, and for those who don't know, it was a, it was a, a black actor-driven show, although the great Gary Shandling was actually a writer on that show for a period of time. Yep. Um, and yeah, the big punchline that got the biggest laugh, and I think it was a studio laugh, maybe it wasn't, maybe it was canned laughter, used the N-word. And talk about the biggest network use of that before that, was Saturday Night Live in the skit with Chevy Chase and Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor, right, when they got into And that's NBC also, because Sanford and Son was also on NBC. Yeah. And, and it, then and you that, have Blazing Saddles. Oh, Blazing and... You're exactly right. Oh, but my see, God! It's, it's again, it's... That's why Blazing Saddles wouldn't work today uh, in, this, in this culture, no. which is a shame because it's... Here we go, and, and, and no matter how you approach this argument, you get beaten up for being just an old white guy. I mean, that always happens. Um, no. You just don't understand it. Uh, you, you just don't get it. It's it's wrong. It's bad. The words are wrong. I, I get it, and things have to evolve. But if you take it in the era that it was presented, I mean, look, Casablanca had some moments in it as well that were insulting. Citizen Kane had insulting moments in it as well. Um, Gone with the Wind. I, I can't, you know, that movie oh, made in sure. the 30s, and people are talking about how racist this was, though it was about a racist era. Right. It, it, there was no doubt. It was, And if you're going to properly um, portray that era, you have to portray it with all the good, the bad, and the warts. And But there are those saying you have to pull those out. See, I think that's part of the discussion here. How much from movies like Airplane, Blazing Saddles, um, Fletch, um, you know, Caddyshack, all those movies, how much of what is in those movies would be missing today under today's um, today's need to be politically correct? I'd say you lose half the movie. And all well, I'd say Blazing Saddles wouldn't ever get made once somebody read the script, even with Mel right. Brooks's name attached. Uh, I don't even know if Mel Brooks would write it that way now. I mean, this is the guy who made a musical about Hitler. Now, it was sarcastic, as anybody with a brain would know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I would have to go back and think about that. But off the top of my head, I think you could still pull off an animal house. Although, no, I take that back. Never mind. All the stuff about, do you mind if we dance with your dates? and Let's see. Us? That skates on the edge right there. Rape. There's also rape in the movie. Like if, you want to, if you want to be honest about it. Animal House does include um oh uh, the underage oh yeah the underage rape being 13 theft. uh you know uh, grand theft if you will um, um vehicle, vehicle, potential vehicular homicide mm -hmm. um 
<laughs> I can't, I can't yeah, believe you're, you're not right. starting to think of Animal House in, in these terms. <laughs> but but you're right in that I don't want I want to sh look, I don't want to disrespect the people who are who are against this stuff because they their voices deserve to be heard. I'll give you a good example of something that I learned yesterday in this the whole thing with Elliot Page. Yes. All right. I've never heard this term before, and I forget it's like you're not supposed to ever refer to Elliot Page's past name. Right. And, and, and I did not know this because if I were writing something about this, I would say formerly known as, as a way to educate people who may not know. But apparently you're not even supposed to do that. Well, I never knew that. Nope. Uh, and and yeah. from, from the moment he announced what he, what his plans were, where he said the pronouns now are he and they, I believe. Right. Is That's name shaming. That's what it's called. Name yeah. shaming. And I thought, well, okay. from a journalistic point of view, the journalist, the, 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 my experience in writing, whether it's sports or whatever, would tell me I would have to at least mention that to somebody who may not get it right away. But I also have to respect the wishes of of the actor and of the the organizations that say, no, 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 you can't do that. It's 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 stuff we never had to deal with. We just had to be right. That was the only thing that mattered, you know, when we were starting out. We just had to be right. We had to be on time or early, but most importantly, just be factual and be accurate. Well, what it is, it's, it's and I, I mentioned this in a post on my Facebook page the other day, I think it was yesterday, on the whole Chris Collinsworth issue, mm -hmm. where what the, the statement Collinsworth made, uh, I met three ladies at Pittsburgh and they came up to me and they were so, they, they knew their football inside and out. Boy, these fans here know it real well. Boom! Social media blows up and everybody's offended and there's a fence by it and you need to apologize. We have we are run these days, whether it's politically, socially, medically, I don't care what it is. We let a few hundred or a few thousand trolls on social media run everything we do these days. That is true. Boy, is that true. If, if somebody gets upset, if there's one thing that's said and there's suddenly 300 comments on Twitter... Holy spit, the country's got to change and stop here in a country of 350 million people and 100 people get upset about it. And, and I, I wrote about it. I said, I didn't see the big deal in it. And I had women weighed in on, on the post, said they weren't insulted by it. One of, one of my uh, great friends mm -hmm. years past, Carrie Ross, who uh, was one of the original yeah, sure, right. at ESPN. She was brilliant what she did. And she put up with a tremendous amount. Of at ESPN yeah. in those days as as a first female anchor, she wasn't offended. But there's other people who came yeah. in and said, absolutely not. He was making fun of women and saying that the women were only there and they were smart about football. And he was shocked because there were women. Stop. Yeah. It, uh, well, the problem is everybody has an outlet at their fingertips, right? And they don't often stop and think before they tweet, and they just fire off their anger, and it it just becomes a dust ball until the next big screw up happens. And then we move on. Okay, what what happened over there? Oh, look, somebody else screwed up. Let's go get which is daily. Which yeah. is, which is daily. You have, you have people out there who are watching for this on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Daily Motion, Vimeo, whatever you want to use, Parlor. You know, they're they're working them on. They're waiting for somebody to say something because it helps make them feel important. Hey, I'm the first one that saw this and I got involved in it. And look, I got 73 clicks that say I really must have had a good, I got a thumbs up from 73 people. Yeah, it's, 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 it's look, the newspaper industry has changed because of it. Now it, it matters, not even what you put out there, but how many people are looking at it, how many people click on the story and all the misleading headlines that are out there that get you to, that sucker you in to click and then up, oh, we got to we got to look at that. Good job, Johnny. We got a bunch of clicks for that story. Well, all right. That's what it's all about because if you go to you know, uh, I've had these discussions many times with people because I did news for a couple of years for a for a despicable group of people that I <laughs> that I that I managed to leave after a few years, um thankfully. Um but it was it was the worst experience of my professional career once I found out who they really were and what they really were pushing. Um they and others push the clickbait headline. And that's important now. People draw into it. It's clicks measure advertising for people. And it's, and I've got this, and everything else I'm doing, I'm, I'm trying to start a show uh, along with the man in the arena called the Press Corps. 
where, and I, and I tried this and I tried it for a few shows and it was actually pretty good where I took a half hour and scoured local news and network news and found stories that were actually true. That were, and you got a half hour out of it. Congratulations! That were factual, <laughs> you know, which factual reporting, and then you you opine on them, of course, but put facts involved in it, and stay away from the nonsense. And you know, we're all I think we're all looking for some way to fight against this, but sure. unfortunately, we're never going to win. I mean, you're going to you're going to grab a few people here and there, but you're not going to grab everybody because you have people who just love the clickbait. Well, it's been proven that facts don't always win out. All right. Um, I'm going to let you go here in a minute because I know you've got other things you need to do today, but let's oh, no, go. I got to go fight with Sears protection agreement on a, uh, on, on, on hanging me up for a month waiting to get a new TV in here. So you'd like to spend more time. Is that what you're saying? All right. But right, you're going to be two hours on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever happened to receptionists, but I digress. Hmm. Christmas time is here. We are listening to holiday music periodically. I don't know, my wife decorated that tree, which you can partly see behind me there, and did an absolutely gorgeous job with it. And while listening to Christmas music while doing so. So give me a couple. They, they can be traditional carols, Ed, or they can be, you know, versions of songs that you and Lady Shannon are like, oh man, we're locked in on these songs. I've got a couple that I'm absolutely enamored with. So I'd like to hear yours. We're almost artists to this point. Brett Eldridge, the country singer, did a song called, did a, an album called Glow a couple of years ago, where he covered some standards and also did a new original song called Glow, which has become one of our all time favorites already. Okay. It's, a, it's a brilliant song. Anything from the Charlie Brown Christmas album. That's awesome. Any time of the year, play it. But at Christmas time, it's the first thing that has to come out of my yes, I still have CDs collection. Okay. I have uh, a few. Yeah, to, to pop it in. I've got thousands. I got to figure out what to do with them. Um, I would say um, that um, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas is still one of the big ones. Rudolph has got to be sung somewhere in there because it's so okay. it's so important. Um, but I also spend a lot of time looking for new music. Um, for instance, the Goo Goo Dolls have a Christmas album out this year. Were they? Did they perform that the other day? They on the, they the parade it or something? On everything that's NBC. Oh, okay, the last week. yeah, they must have there. a deal with them. And they, uh, got for me, you, you mentioned Goo, uh, not Goo Goo Dolls. Good God, Christmas from Charlie Brown Christmas. Yeah, that piano stuff on there oh. is just tremendous. Um, there's two songs that aren't carols, but I'm in every time. One is the Carpenters "Merry Christmas, Baby." Um, I thought I've always thought Merry Karen Carpenter's one was brilliant. Merry Christmas, darling. Thank you. Karen Carpenter is like a guilty pleasure. Yes. Uh, her, without question, one of the finest singers. And look, I, I opened this show by talking about how much I like Rage Against the Machine. So let me Which close it by talking. You, you blew me away oh, when God. you said that. I had no oh, idea. Oh, the anger. The anger alone. Oh, Come on now. God. I've heard I've heard one song by Rage Against the Machine. I've never listened to him again. Oh my God! I have it as loud as I can stand it. Um, <laughs> the, you must be aware of the lyrics to um, "Killing in the Name of." Nope. Look, couldn't tell you one lyric. Couldn't tell look, you one. To, when when you know what when you're on hold for the fifty fifth minute, look them up, and when you read them, you go, "Oh, of course, Dave likes this song." You don't even have to listen <laughs> to the song. I promise you'll you'll understand. I can't okay. repeat. Let me first. I'm not going to repeat them. Okay. Um. Anyway, Karen Carpenter was an utterly staggeringly beautiful vocalist, and yeah. it's a shame what happened to her. Right now, the Carpenters should be doing Vegas residencies or Branson, Missouri residencies, and just making money hand over fist, singing hits, and they would have done it. Another, but my all time favorite, the one that absolutely gets me, is one of the great vocals ever, the great Andy Williams. It's the most wonderful time of the year crushes that good vocal pick. man are you kidding me that's as good as good can get now johnny mathis you know just uh, it's rough. Dang, on an open fire <laughs> is also good. nice thank you but andy williams that song forget about it it's got the big band thing which we, i know we both love um his vocal is fabulous that's that's number one for me that's my favorite of the christmas and i'll songs. tell you one one more i'll throw in here from an album standpoint because again when i get into this brian setzer's orchestra oh yes the the he has two Christmas CDs out, two Christmas albums out. You cannot have a Christmas music collection without both of them. And I got lucky years ago to see him do his Christmas show in Denver. Oh, cool. And he used to go around and he would only do maybe 20 dates a year in different portions of the country, do the Christmas show. 
And he was going to do it this past year. And we had tickets and we were going to go see it. And of course, everything got canceled well, uh, because of COVID. But those two CDs are the rockingest, best musical Christmas CDs anywhere. May I toss at you a Ho Ho Hoey Christmas from the great guitar player Gary Hoey as well. Ah, very nice. Uh, so that, all right, look, Ed, for people to follow the Man in the Arena and all of your other projects, where can people find you? Uh, Facebook, of course, on, uh, on ed.berliner. Everybody knows there. Berliner Speaks is on Facebook. Twitter is Berliner Speaks. The Man in the Arena is the show that I really hope people like and enjoy. It's the interview show. You've been on it. Others have been on it. Our, our great friends are there. It's on uh, It's on my Facebook page and Twitter pages. We do it live uh, most days when we do it. Uh, but you can see all of the episodes at welcometothearena.com on YouTube. Uh, they're all there. And also, if you go to podcast, if you go to any of the major podcast platforms, search out at Berliner or search out Man in the Arena, and you'll find everyone is transferred over to audio there. And uh, we're going to try a few new things, the press corps and others, but the man in the arena is sort of my baby. And I, I really hope that people give it a shot. And uh, we don't always do sports. There was right. a great interview this week with uh, a veteran captain. I uh, saw, yeah, that was really about the Boeing, uh, the, the, uh, the return of the Max. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is uh, Ross Amer. He has uh, been doing this now for almost 50 years, and he has been a pilot and a training captain for Boeing. He knows he, uh, he's been used by networks all over the world. And the show where he talked about the Boeing 737 MAX still being unsafe and where he talked about a lot of the issues that led to it will, will perhaps make you not want to fly for a while, but it will give you- At least a, not on oh, that plane. Yeah. Well, you, I, I wouldn't, let's put it this I wouldn't get on that plane for love nor money. Interesting. And, and not knowing what it was and what was done to it. Right. But Ross Amer was there. Uh, Russell Baxter was there doing football. So I, I hope people uh, catch it. It's, again, it's welcome to the arena dot com on youtube and you can you know what you can double dip and subscribe to both of our youtube channels yes. and you're getting two for one for the same price and that's free see um, and not only that but you're getting but 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 you're getting two of the best guys in sports so i agree you. i think i think we are uh, <laughs> I think you are. Uh, I'm, I'm not i'm not gonna argue with that yeah no, that's yeah we have disagreed <laughs> on a few things us. but by the way, just in case, in case ICE would like, we are looking for sponsors. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm being sponsored today by this joy placemat. So, you know, if anybody <laughs> yeah. who ever made the joy placemat would like to do that. Um, yeah, listen, my friend, you know I love you. Yeah, and... by the way, Seth McFarlane, I am looking for you to be a guest on the show. Yes, I'll take, you know what, I'll even do American Dad Conversations if he wants to join us as well. Cool. So if that happens, you got to call me. Okay. Uh, I love you, my friend. Thank you so much. Good Always. luck with Sears. Uh, say hi to Shannon, and uh, we will certainly talk again, hopefully better yet, in person over cocktails, even over this. As uh, much as I love doing this, we got to figure out an in-person thing when everything calms down. I'm I'm with you. We're there. Stu and the whole crew will get everybody yeah. involved. My, my love to you and Jen and the boys and the puppies and the puppies. Don't forget yep, the dog. She just walked right by here, as a matter of fact, with there a ball in her mouth, ready to go back outside. So We'll talk before then, man. Merry Christmas. I love Same you guys. Same to you, Ed. Take care, buddy. Take That'll care, do it for today's Nooner with Dave Lamont. My thanks again to my great friend, Ed Berliner. Thanks to you for watching. I'll see you Monday. Bye.